this session is Pathways to Decisions. And the, the first speaker is Pietro Bertecchi. Uh, and he's going to talk about this long title talk. And we're looking forward to it. So can you hear me? So in uh, classical lab tasks, like for example, Pavlovian tasks, the causes of an outcome are often explicit. For example, if a stimulus is always followed by a reward, it is very easy for the animal to associate value to the stimulus. In real life, however, the same outcome could have different plausible causes. For example, let's say that our lighter fails to light, we cannot know whether it ran out of gas or if more simply we failed to flick it. But of course, as soon as it lights up, we can be fully sure it still has gas. Now, this uh, inference process uh, is uh, not entirely trivial and should be tuned to the properties of the lighter. For example, if our lighter is faulty, we know that uh, several attempts may be required to actually make sure that it has depleted, several consecutive failures of the lighter. And uh, similar, the environment should also play a role. For example, if the closed shop is very far away, we want to be 100% sure that our lighter is actually depleted before giving up and going out to buy a new one. Now, these uh, real-life ideas can be incorporated into a lab task. So we did that, and we investigated with a cross-species design whether mice and humans are capable of tuning evidence accumulation through task statistics. After having established that uh, interesting computations are going on in our uh, newly designed task, we used optogenetic inactivation in uh, two distinct uh, prefrontal cortices to understand which brain areas may be relevant for these computations. So this is what the task looked like. On this side, you have the mouse version, which is a behavioral box with two pokes, one on the left and one on the right. And the animal has to figure out which side is giving water. And uh, here you have the human version. It's a video game with a castle. And the player has to figure out uh, behind which side of the castle a monster is hiding. Now, uh, not to discriminate between uh, uh, mice and humans, from now on I'll use the uh, species neutral term uh, attempt uh, to refer to a no spoke for the mice and uh, to a tap on the screen, uh, which is the human equivalent. So both versions of the task are governed by the same process that you can see here, which has uh, Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Both versions of the task are governed by the same process, uh, which has uh, two states and alternate between them. So we have the left good state, where attempts on the left are rewarded with some fixed probability P of reward, and attempts on the right are never rewarded. And then, with some probability P of depletion, the left side could deplete, and we would transition to the right good state, where instead attempts on the right are uh, rewarded with some probability. And uh, so we can see that there are two parameters governing the task, probability of reward and probability of depletion. So this is what a typical sequence of attempts on the same side would look like. So uh, here the ticks are rewards and the crosses are failure. And so for example, we are starting, uh, we're starting with the reward, which means we can be 100% sure that we are on the correct side then a failure, and uh, here we have uncertainty because it could be that uh, the state has depleted or more simply it was an unlucky attempt, we cannot know. Then again a reward, so for sure it's the correct side, and so on. And here at the end we have two consecutive failures. Now, given that uh, um, after a reward the probability reset to 100%, consecutive failures are the only relevant quantity the subject needs to take into account to estimate this probability. But of course, a completely different way to look at this task is possible, a more classical value-based approach. So one could say, I start here, I stay, I get a reward, value staying goes up. A failure, value staying goes down. A reward, value staying goes up, and so on and so forth. Now, these two models make different predictions. For example, in the inference, in the evidence model, the consecutive failures are the only relevant quantity. So if we split by reward number, that doesn't matter at all. 
so we get uh, three overlapping distributions. Instead, naturally, in a value-based models, the more, uh, the more rewards, the longer the animal should be willing to stay, as we can see by the shift in, this, in the distributions. And uh, very interesting, when we look at the data for uh, rodents and for humans, we see that in both cases, the distributions overlap, meaning that both mice and humans are accumulating evidence and not value in this task. So, as I mentioned before, the task is governed by two parameters, probability of reward and uh, probability of depletion. And uh, they affect the inference process. So even the same sequence of uh, rewards and failures can lead to different inferences. So we focused on, two, we focused on three uh, different protocols with very level of probability of rewards. So the first one is the hard protocol with 30% probability of reward and 30% probability of depletion. And I say hard because here failures are common in the correct state, so you need many to be sure, be sure that the state is depleted. And then we move all the way to the easy protocol with 90% probability of reward and 90% probability of depletion, where very few failures are necessary. As you can see here in this graph, where I'm choosing the same sequence of one reward and three failures, and then plotting how the probability of being in the correct side evolves in the three protocols. And here, this line represents the indifference point between staying and leaving, meaning that uh, when the probability of being correct goes below this, uh, this line, then you should be more willing to leave than to stay. And uh, then when we look at the behavior and we see the average number of consecutive failures as a function of the protocol, we see that both for mice and for humans, compatibly with the, with the optimal model, the, the least informative a failure, so the hardest the protocol, the more failures are needed to the animal to trigger a decision to leave in the, in the two species. Then as a separate manipulation, we'd also played with the travel cost. So to increase the travel cost in the mice, we simply add the barrier between the two nose pokes. And in the humans, so we slow down the player velocity in the, in the video game. And uh, that, that should correspond uh, normatively to a decrease in the indifference point between staying and leaving. So you should be less willing to leave, which translates in more consecutive failures before leaving. As you can see, both in mice and in humans from these points above the diagonal, especially in the hardest protocol. Then after having understood uh, uh, the mean values of the behavior, we turn to the variability. So the most striking finding that we saw is the Weber scaling. So for those who are not familiar with it, it says that for uh, different uh, protocols, the distribution should be scale invariant. So this, the behavior in one protocol should be the behavior in another protocol, but rescaled by some constant. And we visualize it here by showing that all these six distributions, so these are actually six lines of consecutive failures before leaving, overlap once I renormalize them by their mean. And the classical way to explain this from the theory of time is called the behavioral, uh, behavioral theory of timing from Killing and Fetterman, states that this could arise from some uh, Poisson spike train that is accumulated by some integrator, and when this reaches a threshold, it triggers the decision of the animal, in this case, to leave. And uh, different rates of the Poisson process would correspond to different protocols. And, uh, this makes the prediction that for a high number of consecutive failures, the probability of leaving at a given uh, attempt uh, should actually plateau at different levels for the different protocols. This is in contrast with the uh, uh, softmax decision noise, so a classical way to add noise to reinforce my learning problems, according to which at every step the animal would do perfect inference and then toss a biased coin to decide whether to stay or to leave and in which case, after many failures, when inference has been completed, the probability of leaving should be the same across all protocols. But what we see in the behavior, again, for both species, is, uh, is that this, uh, these lines plateau at different values, meaning that uh, the mice are, are closer to the Poisson accumulation noise model. And uh, to confirm that, we feed this simple model by using different Poisson rates to take into account uh, different protocols, and we simulate it, and what we see is that uh, the model closely resembles the data, both for the mice and for the humans. So to sum up what we saw so far, 
We saw that both mice and humans can use probabilistic inference to solve a foraging task under non-sensory uncertainty. Mice and humans can tune the evidence computation to the statistics of the environment. And the variability in the behavior is given by scaling invariant evidence accumulation noise, which we model with the Poisson process, and not simply by some decision noise. Having established that interesting computation are going on in the task, we try to understand where they could be implemented. And we first looked at the anterior cingulate cortex, which has been implicated already in accumulation to threshold processes in foraging, as well as accumulation of consecutive negative outcomes. And we inactivated the anterior cingulate cortex during, uh, during poking, and uh, what we saw is that we see an increase in the inactivated trials in consecutive failures before leaving, especially in the hardest uh, protocol. And the fact is multiplicative, as you can see here, by, by looking at the ratio, which is constant across protocols. Uh, next, we turn to the orbitofrontal cortex, which is also related to this, task, to this task, because it has been hypothesized to encode uh, an abstract task-specific state representation, which in this case could correspond to the hidden left good, right good state. And what we see is much more complex in that in some protocol you see an increase in consecutive failures and in another protocol a decrease. And indeed looking at the ratio doesn't, uh, doesn't solve this, uh, this riddle. And what's going on if you look closer is that the premises that allowed us to carry on with our consecutive failure analysis are breaking down when the UFC is inactivated. So as you can see here in the inactivated trials, the number of rewards will start playing a role. So when the UFC is inactivated, the more rewards, the longer you stay, which was not the case in uh, the normal task or even when the ACC is inactivated. And to see that the single animal level, we did the simple linear regression model where we tried to predict consecutive failures as a function of stimulation times reward number. And only in OFC, we see an interaction uh, between the steam and the reward number, meaning only in OFC, when I stimulate uh, our uh, Viga chanropsin animals does inactivating OFC, I get an effect of rewards number which does destruct the correct accumulation process. So to, to conclude with our inactivation study summary, we can say that our task is rich enough to differentiate between uh, the role of ACC and OFC. And in particular, we have seen that uh, the ACC inactivation simply modulates this accumulation process multiplicatively, whereas the OFC inactivation alters the behavior qualitatively, destroying signatures of the correct inference process and the on the correct state representation. So we can say that OFC is a good candidate area for the computation or the encoding of a task-specific st state space, as was already hypothesized in the Wilson et al. paper. So with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, Eranda, Rio Beatrice, Tiago, Isaac, Matthias, my PI, Isaac Mainen, and the graphic designers, Diogo and Shira, as well as the Champalimo Foundation and funding. And thank you. Any questions? Uh, let me ask you a quick question. Um, when you're fitting the Poisson accumulation models, uh, how are you fitting these parameters to the data? Can you tell us more about the details? Um, yeah, it's a very important question. So what happens is that the most, uh, so the most principled way to fit all of this model is via maximum likelihood. However, and this I think is a very general feature of using maximum likelihood to fit uh, accumulation to bound processes, is that it is very sensitive to outliers. So if in a single trial the animals would quit after, uh, after a reward, maybe we didn't even notice the mistake, it has nothing to do with the process, then this would have likelihood zero and would make explode the fit. So uh, I haven't told you this implementation detail, but I allow some uh, lapse rate uh, epsilon. In, and uh, so with probability one minus epsilon, I follow the normal Poisson process, and instead with probability epsilon, I just toss a coin to, to leave. So it's uh, uh, maximum likelihood taking into account uh, correction for outliers. All right, let's thank the speaker again.